Now Bonaparte moved to consolidate his rule. At his urging, the French Constitution was again amended. And at 33, Bonaparte became first consul for life, with near dictatorial powers, a king in all but name. The more power that Bonaparte gets, the more he wants. And it escalates step by step, never too much at once, always step by step gradually, and always with Napoleon looking back and saying, remember, I am going to protect the gains of the revolution. They're safe with me. As the 19th century began, Bonaparte set out to prove that he could govern as well as he could fight. A newborn government, he told his secretary, must dazzle and astonish. He built new parks, bridges and caves along the Seine, canals, reservoirs, and roads. He would make Paris, he said, the loveliest city that ever was or ever could be. And France, the greatest country on earth. Launching a series of sweeping political, economic, and legal reforms, he laid the foundation for a new France. All of French society came under his gaze. He set in place a strong, centralized government with a tightly structured, far-reaching bureaucracy organized a new system of state secondary schools, the Lycée, established a central bank, the Bank of France. Slowly, the economy revived, and with it, prosperity. All of Europe was in awe. The great artists and thinkers of the day, Goethe, Hegel, Byron, Beethoven, saw in Bonaparte the embodiment of the ideals and hopes of the revolution. He oversaw the codification of a new system of laws, which abolished feudal privileges and established the equality of every man before the law. Bonaparte's civil code remains the basis of French law to this day. In 1801, Bonaparte signed an agreement with the Pope, the Concordat, making Catholicism the dominant but not exclusive religion of France. He had no personal use for religion, but he understood its political value. If I governed a nation of Jews, he said, I should restore the Temple of Solomon. Religion is excellent stuff for keeping common people quiet. Bonaparte ruled with the carrot and the stick. To reward men of accomplishment, he created a special mark of esteem, the Legion of Honor. My motto has always been, he said, a career open to all talents, without distinctions of birth. He believed in equality. A man should have the chance to rise on the basis of his ability, just as he had done. But he had no patience with those who demanded liberty. He ruled with an iron hand, crushing anyone who dared speak out against him, making a sham of parliament and free elections. I had been nourished by reflecting on liberty, Bonaparte said, but I thrust it aside when it obstructed my path. His victories had already made France larger than it had ever been. He was the most feared man in Europe, and his authority at home remained unchallenged. Thirty-four years old, he was as powerful as any of the Bourbon kings who had come before him. All he lacked was a crown. Now he decided he wanted one. He wished to be a king. His idea is that given what France has achieved in, in the world, it ought to be considered as a kind of empire with Napoleon Bonaparte as the emperor. This would put him on an equal footing with the monarchs of Europe. Uh, he would no longer uh, be an upstart. He would be one of the club. On December 2nd, 1804, the imperial procession made its way through Paris. 
a Senate proclamation and a vote of the people, both carefully arranged by Bonaparte himself, had given him what he wanted. He was about to become an emperor. As soon as a man becomes a king, he is set apart from all other men, Bonaparte said. I always felt that Alexander the Great's idea of pretending to be descended from a god was inspired by a sure instinct for real politics. In spite of the cold, a half million cheering spectators lined the streets. Bonaparte himself had meticulously planned every detail. The great cathedral, hung with pennants and tapestries and decorated like a Roman temple, seemed more like a theater than a church. But Bonaparte wanted his elevation to glow with the aura of religion. The Pope had been brought from Italy to sanctify the occasion. He has the genius of making the Pope come to Paris, which gives everything a sacred air. It is God who confirms that the changes that took place during the revolution are forever established. Slowly, Bonaparte and Josephine walked toward the two thrones that awaited them. His mantle, adorned with gold and precious jewels and weighing 80 pounds, was supported by his brothers. He looked, one spectator said, like a Caesar on a Roman coin. A little more than 10 years before, the French had beheaded a king. Now they were crowning an emperor. Born upon the great tide of the French Revolution and the wars that followed in its wake, Bonaparte had turned his genius as a general and a statesman to the domination of France. Soon, he would turn toward the conquest of Europe. Already, he was planning an invasion of Great Britain to make him master of the island nation that dared defy him. Confidently, Bonaparte lifted the imperial crown. And brought it to rest on his own head. Then he moved toward Josephine and crowned her his empress. I am the instrument of providence, Napoleon said. She will use me as long as I accomplish her designs. Then she will break me like a glass. <laughs> 